Welcome to our Southern Hemisphere Space Studies Program public event um, uh, with the rather complicated title this evening of Government, Industry and Universities Partnering, Partnering in Space Economy Development. Uh, so my name's Michael Davis. Um, I am the chair of the Space Industry Association of Australia and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all and it's great to see uh, uh, all of you here uh, from many from uh, lo from local community and also from uh, the South Australian space community and we also have our 50 participants in our program from 15 countries in welcoming you i remind you that we're meeting on the land of the Ghana people and we pay our respects to their elders and their living culture. The global space industry is undergoing rapid reinvention. While all of us are fascinated by the wonders of space exploration and cosmology, space is also a fast-growing and fiercely competitive commercial sector. As falling launch costs and high levels of private funding continue to push the price of entry, lower and lower. As one of the last advanced countries in the world to establish a national space agency, we face the interesting challenge of designing a national space program that captures the economic and social benefits of government coordination and support for research and development, while at the same time avoiding the pitfalls of too much central regu regulation and bureaucracy. This evening we'll be looking at the industry um, and uh, just bear with me and the university precinct that is based around this township of Mawson Lakes and we'll use it as a case study in which we examine the role not of the national government but of local and state governments as they interact and cooperate with industry and universities in working together to take advantage of the new opportunities for space industry development. And this, we hope, will lead to more investment by companies in space-related facilities and services and exciting opportunities for young professionals, including some of the participants of this program. This evening we are privileged to have an impressive panel of university, industry and government leaders to share their insights and I'll introduce each of them in turn. The City of Salisbury has been the local government host of this program since its inception in 2011. This year we are delighted that the Salisbury Council has come on board as an event sponsor, as, as the sponsor of this event, and also as a sponsor of the exhibition of the spectacular space images and art that's on display in the common areas just outside this lecture room. And when we invite you to join us for refreshments, uh, please uh, enjoy the uh, art exhibition, which, uh, as I say, is also sponsored by the, uh, the, the City of Salisbury. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Councillor Graham Rich, uh, Reynolds from the City of Salisbury. He was first elected in 2014 as a councillor representing, representing the North Ward, which includes the RAAF base at Edinburgh and DSTG at Edinburgh. He served, it's, it's appropriate that he should represent that part of the uh, council area because he served for over 28 years in the Air Force and has a Bachelor of Aerospace Engineering. He, uh, during his Air Force career he, was, he served in numerous roles on the P-3 Orion project, the Heron Unmanned Aerial System, Jin, the Jindalee Operational Radar Network and numerous other projects. As a long-term northern suburbs resident, he's passionate about Salisbury realising its potential and the opportunities that the space industry presents to local residents and the workforce of the future. Please welcome Councillor Graham Reynolds.
sorry, I didn't realise my photo was going to be up there. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for the invitation to be here tonight, and um, it's especially great to see the kids here. For, uh, you know, for what, for the potential, the opportunities we have for our kids today, and, and the passion we've got around here. You're probably looking at all this and you're going, why the hell have we got council here? Right? Aren't they about rates, what is it, three R's? Rates, road, rubbish? There's no rockets in all that. What the hell are they doing here? I guess I'll go to, next slide, see if I can get this right. There we go. I guess at this point in time, I'd just like to point out the Salisbury logo, not the other, not the little Gucci fancy one you've seen before. Just have a look at the Salisbury logo up there, the middle slide there. What do you see right in the middle of that logo? Have we got council? <laughs> That's one thing. The other thing you might be able to pick out is there's a rocket right in the middle of the Salisbury logo there. Right? It's one of the reasons why Salisbury was formed, actually, back 50, 60 years ago. Basically, it was to support the testing at Maralinga and Woomera, the formation of the Ra uh, RAF Edinburgh, um, the Air Force Base in Edinburgh, to support that. We also have the old WRE. In fact, my grandfather worked for WRE, the old weapons research establishment. We now know them as... Uh, DSTG out of Edinburgh too, and they're a, they do a great job. But the things that made Salisbury attractive back then, 50, 60 years ago, are the same things that make Salisbury attractive today, right? Location, you buy a major city, you've got Parafoot Airport right here, you've got the RAF Base Edinburgh right there, you've still got DSTG, right? You're not that far from the city. There's a lot of things that make biz doing business in Salisbury very attractive. You have a look at who else we've got here in terms of company-wise. Right now we've got Saab, we've got Lockheed Martin, um, there's Boeing, there's BAE Systems, all within Salisbury as well, very close to where we are. Not only that, you've then got uh, other companies, smaller niche companies, so you've got the Daramonts, you've got the Speedcast here as well. Um, on top of that, in the Department of Defence, we've got the Wide Area Space Surveillance Systems Program Office, which uh, we've got some representatives here today as well. So, so we've got... The large companies, we've got the, I'll say, middle tier companies, niche companies, but you also have both defence and industry and the government here in Salisbury as well. Makes it a great place to do business around here. Not only that, we've got the acad academia here and we've got Professor Tanya Munro, who's going to come along after me, from UniSA. UniSA, they've got what? Future Industries Institute. They've got the Institute for Telecommunications Research. Advanced Computer Research Centre. And the other beauty about Adelaide, Salisbury, Australia in general is we're ge geographically well positioned for launches, Woomera. We're very electronically quiet as well, which in a crowded nor northern hemisphere, the electromagnetic environment there, very important quality that very few countries and, dare I say, even states have. It's something you probably couldn't launch out of New South Wales or Victoria. They're just too electronically noisy. South Australia, Woomera, fantastic environment. So we talk about an industry. Industry are there to make money. You can't have an industry if it's not going to make money. Right? So businesses need to be able to reduce their costs. They've got to make a profit. That's what they're in business for, making a profit. We understand that. So where does Salisbury Council fit in that? As I said, location. Great location with Adelaide, cost of living in Adelaide. Infrastructure, as I say, we've got the airports close by. Gig City we have now, I believe, someone correct me from, Gig City we've got here at Mawson Lakes. We're looking to get Gig City at Edinburgh Parks as well, or it's there already. It's going to be future, we're planning on it, OK. So we've got the infrastructure. Similarly, we've got the supportive council environment. So we do have the uh, places like Polaris Centre. We've got Nina here from the Polaris Centre. So council is more than just rates, road and rubbish. We're also about generating a positive business environment. Again, companies, businesses are there to make money. We understand that. Of course, businesses have employed people. People have families, right? You can't just look at it and go, oh, I want to build a satellite, I want to build a rocket. Because to do that, A, you've got to have the business makes money, B, you've got to have the people who want to come to you. And, and as I say, the, the people have families, so it's got to be attractive to them as well. So city of Salisbury, yep. Fifth most livable city, I think Melbourne's number one, unfortunately. Got to remember the best view of Melbourne's in your rear vision mirror as you leave, but that's another story. 
right? We've got housing affordability, transport, recreation activities. We've got the schools, right? We've got the universities. We've got the things that the people are looking for who have their families so that they can grow up here to make it attractive, again, for businesses to recruit people to be here in Salisbury. It's my last slide. So, so why Salisbury? What's our role? In the first slide, we had... I had the term innovation, and, and I know everything I've said so far sounds very much like advertisements for Salisbury, and it is, <laughs> right? It is. But, you know, if you're a small niche company looking for somewhere to do business, again, you want that to be attractive. You want the conditions to be attractive. You want the cost to be low, because you are there to make money. Salisbury can help you fit into that. You know, and where I talk about the small businesses, OK, except we've got the Lockheeds, we've got the Saabs, we've got the BAs, and they are fantastic. We've got the middle tiers. But, you know, if you're a niche company, we're not just about building rockets, building satellites. That's sexy stuff, I know. Everyone wants to build a satellite, everyone wants to build a rocket. But why do we launch satellites? There's a purpose for the satellites. It might be defence, it might be agricultural. There's a whole heap of data that those satellites are sucking up and bringing down. Niche companies, to me, can really be used to harvest that data and turn it into, I'll use the military term, executable intelligence. Otherwise, it's just ones and zeros. That's where I think some niche companies can really make a difference. And that's why we have to keep the costs low to promote all that, thing, promote all that happening. As I say, the first slide I had had the word innovation up there. And, you know, when I was first elected, one of the things that Salisbury was known for was water. Again, another sexy topic. Water management. You know, 20 years ago, the wetlands and all that. We're now known for water. And the question I often asked a lot of people out there was, you know, I want to, I'm very passionate about what's going to be the thing in 20 years' time that we're going to sit here and go, what's Salisbury we known for? What's Salisbury we known internationally for? We've got the opportunity, and certainly it looks like we've got the willpower, the passion and the potential in this room alone to make Salisbury known as the space industry hub in Australia. Right? We've got the universities on board, we've got the companies on board, we've got local government on board, we've got representatives from state government, we just need the federal government there as well. What we now have to do is actually convince others that we can make it happen. Salisbury Council, as you can see, we're more than just road, rate, rubbish. We're about, uh, we, we are a significant stakeholder in this, and um, I hope to, in 20 years' time, be talking to people about the start of the space industry in Salisbury and going to hearing from international players coming here and saying how renowned we are for everyone in this room for the work we do in the space industry for South Australia and for Australia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our second distinguished guest is Professor Tanya Munro, Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University of South Australia. Um, she has many, many um, achievements and credits to her name as a scientist, and including um, the fact that she was inaugural director of the ARC Centre for Excellence for nanoscale biophotonics. And I'm not sure whether you'll have a chance to explain that to us, Tanya, but um, she is now um, in, uh, responsible for research and innovation at this university, and she is a, a big supporter of um, this program, and so it's a, it gives me great pleasure to invite you to say a few words. Thank you, Michael. It's a great pleasure to be here to share a few thoughts with you um, at this very exciting time in the program. On behalf of UniSA, welcome um, to this campus and to this event tonight. I'm going to be talking about universities in space and what UniSA is doing in this domain, how you can engage, and um, what our capabilities are in space. I'll see if I can fit within my five minutes right at the end, what is nanoscale biophotonics in space? <laughs> I won't go through this slide in detail. You all know the context, and you are all here and committed to space and the opportunities it brings. 
But I guess the starting point I'd like to make is that I see that the success we'll have in future in space industry really comes down to how well we can bring together collaborations between universities, the industry sector, and our budding entrepreneurs. I think we've got the ingredients to make that right, but the heart of all good collaboration is understanding each other, increasing the mobility of people between these three sectors and facilitating the creation of that shared language. And that's really what we have focused on from our part in the role of this collaboration. Briefly, for those of you who might not know UniSA, I'd just like to capture it in a nutshell so you can see how we're different. We're not a traditional university. We're young. We're 26 years young, although we're built on older foundations. And we pride ourselves in being Australia's university of enterprise. Now, what that means for us is that we don't just create knowledge for the sake of it, but we create knowledge intending to create impact. And the way we do that is by partnering with people who might ultimately use it and encouraging entrepreneurship. And in doing that, we prioritise really making sure the people we hire are geared towards working with industry. We often hire directly from industry. And we have a rich tradition of doing work that is much more than simply just applied. But where we do fundamental research and long-term research, it's grounded in the knowledge of what can have application. I don't expect you to read all the details of my slides, but I put them up in the hope that if something tantalizes you, you'll throw it at us in the panel discussion. But basically, that what we think around the vision for South Australia's space industry is that we need to invigorate South Australia's space ecosystem by taking the foundations we've got at our university in terms of knowledge creation and research, but making sure that that is partnered wherever possible, not just with the budding entrepreneurs, but with the existing companies we have. Just to give an example, um, our Future Industries Institute is all about helping existing companies embrace disruptive technologies and helping seed the industries of tomorrow. That is an example of what we're trying to do here at this university. And I've listed here some of the research areas, which I'll give a little bit more flavour to in a minute, where we have specific expertise that really plays into space. One of the things we're doing that's quite bold at the moment, in addition to hiring people that have come from industry with non-traditional, perhaps non-academic track records, is we, with our state government, have created the Future Industry Accelerator, which encourages that growth of partnership between industry and academia by paying for people to spend up to a year going either from the university into a company or from the company into the university. Because one of the challenges we face in Australia, as many might know, but the visitors to Australia might not, is that our companies overall have less PhD trained people within them and thus have often less knowledge of the value that research can bring to their business. And so that's something that we wish to play a role in changing. I've got here a list of really the high-level um, capability that UniSA has in space. Michael mentioned, and in fact Graham mentioned before, ITR, our Institute for Telecommunications Research, has had a proud and long track record in developing satellite communications and other related technologies in the space arena. And not only has this been outstanding quality research, but has led to a number of notable commercial successes, new companies, significant employers, and we're very proud of that and hope that many more of those will continue. Miriota's a recent example, a very exciting example I'm sure many of you have heard of. One thing we do do that's distinctive at UniSA is we are now making it very clear that our game is not about holding on to IP. Uh, intellectual property only exists there to be turned into products and services. So we are happy to vest intellectual property in whatever partner we think will help us get it into outcome and into product. And I am already seeing this change, the appetite of industry to work with us and our researchers. 
We also have very significant capability in data analytics and AI, which clearly talks to the space agenda, and have numerous other space-related research strengths, right through from nanoengineering to things related to human factors. If I had to pick the two things that make us distinctive in research, I've already told you one, where end user engaged. But the one I haven't told you, which really makes a huge difference in this domain, is that we're Australia's most interdisciplinary university. That comes from the fact that we have, since we were founded, focused on working with partners and on problems. And when you work with partners and on problems, it doesn't respect discipline boundaries. So that's something that we think can help enormously in space, because instead of taking, say, a purely engineering approach, we can assemble the interdisciplinary teams to really come up with solutions. In addition, we've been working with the International Space University and through other mechanisms to help foster entrepreneurship and help our students experiment while they're in the safe environment of higher education with becoming startup founders and learning those lessons that encourage them to try and make jobs rather than take jobs. So last, I'll finish with just um, a slide giving you some awareness of something we're actively driving at the moment, and I see Professor Andy Coronius, if you can wave. He's working very hard on this to put together a bid for a CRC for satellite systems and advanced communications. For those from outside Australia, the CRC program, or Cooperative Research Centre program, has been running for decades. It is an extremely um, um, uh, efficient program for bringing industry and academia together to work on long-term challenges that can have practical application. I started my PhD in one, so I'm very fond of the scheme. And we're putting together a bid for one in this domain. Our vision is to be the leading contributor to Australia's space economy through satellite technologies and analytics. And we're in a very busy stage of working with partners in order to flesh out some of the programs and activities within this cooperative research centre and would love to talk more about it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. And, and now um, we move to the private sector, and um, we're very fortunate this evening to have representatives of a number of the big international aerospace primes, um, including Lockheed Martin, who um, was uh, the anchor sponsor of um, the International Astronautical Congress that um, many of you would have attended. And um, I have to say, without their very strong support uh, right here in Australia, it wouldn't have been possible for us to stage the IAC. So we are very, very grateful to Lockheed Martin. Jack Marnie is the general manager of Lockheed Martin's operation um, here in um, Technology Park, Mawson Lakes. And he has a distinguished career as a project director and technical manager, um, orig originally from uh, the New York State in the US. Um, he um, was involved in uh, projects um, in, for the US Navy uh, before coming and uh, working here. And uh, he is a very experienced um, senior executive from Lockheed Martin. It gives me great pleasure to welcome him. Good evening. Uh, note to oneself, never, never follow an eminent professor who's got slides and, and is very engaging. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. Wayne, I'm going to make you look really good. <laughs> I'm going to take a, a kind of a position of why does industry, um, one, locate itself in any particular place, and, and two, what are the key elements of why you do that? Uh, another point will be about why we enter into certain markets. Um, first one is the, the location. The company normally goes through and does an analysis and, and tries to determine three key items. A, where's my customers coming from? And nowadays, a lot of them, it's online, so that doesn't matter too much. Um, the second one is the supply lines. What do I need to actually produ produce my products? And the third being the human resource. What's my staff going to be? Where can I get those staff, and where would I locate those? Um, in the case of why we came to Moss and Lakes, uh, we were originally in Melbourne uh, about 15 years ago. Our customer moved 
basically where it was operating from out of Canberra to here in Adelaide and, and to make sure that we had close proximity to our customer, we moved from Melbourne to Adelaide. Now, they were up at the raft base. Why are we in Moss and Lakes? Well, it comes down to the human resource. When you go to look at what's available in the marketplace and what we need as critical skills, we do a survey of the areas where we think we can get those. Well, number one is out of universities. So we want to be in an area where universities are generating the engineers that we need into the future. Second is, we never really own employees. We, we employ employees. Employees go through and look for new challenges. They're always looking for a better project to work on. Um, in our case, we, we surveyed Moss and Lakes once again, realized at the time we moved here, Motorola was here, BAE was here, Tenix was here, Saab was here. It's a perfect poaching environment. So. <laughs> So, number one reason we move into Moss and Lakes is so we can actually share those resources. Uh, and and it's, it's true, because the resources do move around. They look for the next exciting opportunity. No, same reason that people continue certain studies in certain areas. They're looking for that next challenge. <coughs> um, entering into new markets, you know, a, a company has to go through and verify what its core capabilities are. So what is its strengths? It, it, it's rare that a company will actually erase everything it's done over its history and start up completely brand new. Um, the cost of doing that is astro astronomical. Um, potentially, you could if, it, if the market, you know, and I'll use uh, iPhone apps, you know, there wasn't a whole lot out there, but those that found it, got into it, some of them redefined their entire business model to go into that business, and it has been very, very lucrative. Large corporations like ourselves, yeah, we're kind of like a huge ship that takes forever to turn and steer. So we can't reinvent ourselves overnight that quickly. So what we do is we identify what our core capabilities are, and then we look for, once we identify those, we also look for transferable skill. Um, the case in point would be that someone that was um, a telecommunications engineer working for Optus how does that apply to defense? Well, potentially they could actually apply to defense because, A, they have an engineering background. Two, defense does a lot of communications, whether it's actual telecommunications or it's interfaces talking back and forth. There's a lot of similar um, properties to that. So in that transferable skill, you can reutilize a very large portion of your workforce, but you augment it with what we'll call like nodes of influence. Key people that can actually have the ability to turn around and work with and guide that core capability and reshape it into the future needs. Um, and then when, when you take that movement into that new market, it's usually kind of a, a slow step. Uh, um, not quite a startup, but very, very similar. You put your toe in the water, you find out if there's anything there. Um, if you get a little bit of feedback from a customer that you might be on the right road, you put the next toe in, the next toe in, until you start to build up what we call a line of business. Um, so I'll end with, does South Australia have a space ecosystem to allow companies such as ours to move into those directions? Well, the answer is yes. There are already core capabilities here, just north of us at uh, the RAF base. Um, the universities are already working in space. DSTO is already working in space. Some of my panelists are already working in space. So you already have the ecosystem. And it's really critical that the universities where you actually need to grow the intelligence for the future has that in their mind, because that's what we poach from. So we look for where we're going to get the next breed of engineers and innovators, and we find out where we can use them and apply them into the future. So I think, once again, South Australia does have the ecosystem. Moss and Lakes, as it currently stands, is an excellent place to, to continue to grow and, and situate those. Um, and into the future, I think we can actually set the standard just as we've done from a defense industry state perspective. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jack. Um, another um, leading international aerospace or defence contractor is uh, Saab Systems, and uh, today we're very pleased to welcome Wayne Agata, who was um, a native South Australian, born and educated here, but he, um, like many young Australian engineers, um, gained early experience working in Europe, in the UK and Germany, and he's worked for British Aerospace, the European Space Agency, and the International Maritime Satellite Organisation, INMARSAT. 
So he has a very strong background in um, satellite engineering. He's currently Director of Strategy and Emerging Markets at Saab Australia, uh, based in Adelaide. And his job is to look at new technologies and new business areas for Saab. And so it gives me great pleasure to welcome Wayne Agata. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I thought I'd take a slightly different tack and not talk to you too much about uh, Saab the Corporation, although I will uh, touch on it at the end. But I'd perhaps like to share um, my personal journey in the space industry. So you're all here as part of a, a space studies course, um, and I experienced something similar. So I, as, as Mike said, I grew up in, uh, in Adelaide. <coughs> in fact, looking across the, um, <coughs> the sheep paddocks to what was then the weapons research establishment. Um, and that was in the era of the Apollo program. If there was a more exciting time in, in space, then I guess I'm, I'm sort of hard-pressed to find it. And uh, in 1980, I was very fortunate to get the opportunity to, um, to go to Europe and become involved in the industry, uh, working for, for British Aerospace. And I was one of about 100 Australian engineers that were recruited um, to go and work in the UK um, in the burgeoning industry there. We came from all different walks of life. I was a computer scientist by, uh, by training, so I knew nothing about satellites, really. Um, but on day one, when we turned up, we all got shipped off to uh, Southampton University for a six-week residential course on space technology. So we did propulsion, and we did control systems, and mission analysis, and material science, and thermal and electronic management. And that really set the basis for what turned into a 13-year uh, a career working in, uh, in Europe in space. So I guess you guys are all in the same sort of environment now, starting out in your careers. Um, and mine was really exciting. I worked in uh, communication satellites. I worked in uh, on the Halley's Comet uh, intercept probe called Giotto, which was a once in a lifetime, or at least once in 76-year opportunity, um, in, in, the, in the satellite design phase. Um, many years later, I moved to, uh, to Europe. Uh, I worked for the European Space Agency, uh, in their ground control facilities in Darmstadt in Germany. And having worked on the satellite design, I was really fortunate then to be involved in the actual encounter, working in the mission control centre during the flyby of the comet. So it's really interesting perspective to work on the design stage, to look then at the ground segment and into the operational part of the, uh, of, of the business. I then worked for, um, went, went to uh, Inmarsat, and I was part of a very small team, only about 40 people that procured in Marsat's first generation of wholly owned satellites, so three satellite constellation, plus all of the ground infrastructure, worldwide network of uh, telemetry and tracking stations. And, and I think the thing that's interesting is it was a really small team. So you don't need hundreds, and hundreds of people to run a big space program. What you need is a lot of skills and a lot of industry behind you to support that procurement and that it's set to work. So today I work for Saab. Saab, not the car company, Saab's a big uh, aerospace and defence company, builds everything from submarines to uh, fourth generation jet fighters. And Saab itself has a long uh, history in, in space, dating back to the early 80s. Um, but in fact it sold out of the business uh, in uh, 2008, just 10 years ago, um, as it concentrated on its core defence business. And I guess that was in a period when there was a bit of a lull in space activity. So. You have to remember that in the 80s and 90s, space was a business for big business. It was complicated. Launch vehicles were expensive. They were unreliable. I was personally involved in two complete mission failures, which lasted about uh, 7 and 13 seconds, respectively. Um, and the technology required for, for space was, was difficult. Right? We were inventing new technologies. We were meeting new challenges that hadn't been, uh, hadn't been seen before. And therefore, for many businesses, it was a very difficult thing to be involved in. However, the environment today, I think, is completely different. Um, we now have, due to advances in, in electronics and computing power, the ability to build satellites very cheaply. Um, launch vehicle costs are coming down. Satellites are much smaller. They're much cheaper to launch. Uh, we have the ability to piggyback multiple uh, vehicles on a single launch. And therefore, I think the technical challenges involved with design, production, and manufacture um, are much less. And what we really need to turn our attention to 
I think, is the way that we're going to exploit the technologies. There's, for, every, for every dollar that's spent and made in launching and building satellites, there's a huge, uh, huge amount more spent on the exploitation, whether it's remote sensing, whether it's telecommunications, positioning. So there are many industries which are driven off of space technology where there's, an, I guess, a low barrier of entry, as, uh, as some of our presenters have said before, and plenty of opportunity for industry to get involved. So one of the things we do have in, in, in this state and in this, uh, this region is a concentration of companies with very good base technology, very skilled people, uh, and therefore the opportunity to leverage that and to build new industries. Um, for me, one of the key things, and, and I hark back to, to my interest in space, to be successful, though, we have to get the permission of the population for investment. When the Apollo program was running, when the space shuttle first started up, space was a talking point for everybody, and there was a huge will to be successful and to be involved. And now it's become routine to a certain extent, and that has gone away. So how do we invigorate, reinvigorate, and get the, uh, the popular permission for our governments to invest and support the space industry? And I think that's one of the sort of key challenges of, of, the, conf of the theme of this conference. So <laughs> look forward to hearing your, uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you. And um, now I have a great pleasure in welcoming Mike Keneally, who um, is a glutton for punishment. Uh, not only does he work for one of the most exciting uh, new startup companies uh, based in South Australia, Fleet Space Technologies, and not only are they uh, in the process of um, designing building and launching 100 nanosats for uh, communication between um, internet-connected devices throughout the globe. But um, he has retained his previous position as Senior Director of Business Development for Speedcast, which is uh, an international company that operates teleports, including the teleport that you drove past as you turned left from Main North Road into Mawson Lakes Boulevard. And they are a, a major tenant and, uh, 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 and operator of uh, ground stations in Mawson Lakes. And so in the short amount of time uh, available, Mike, um, we look forward to hearing how you combine both of those roles. Thank you very much. I will uh, really just talk about the two companies and uh, uh, talk about their differences and talk about their challenges and probably the opportunities that they present to all of the people here. Um, we've been a passionate supporter of the program right since, it, since its inception here and um, we've uh, hosted every group that's come through and uh, pleased to keep doing that. We see it as uh, a part of our uh, social responsibility, but also something that's good for good for business. So uh, we'll talk about both. Speedcast is a um, company that deals not only with ground segment, but deals with integration, making... Every satellite that goes up has to talk to the ground, and every link to the ground has to be integrated to some source, to the cloud, to a corporate network, to some sort of endpoint for it to become valuable. And Speedcast is all about that. Speedcast is an Australian company listed on the Australian Stock Exchange in uh, 2014, uh, but it started out as a teleport in Hong Kong. So uh, it was a teleport in Hong Kong that went and raised some money, went and acquired a uh, couple of other companies, listed on the ASX, and uh, is now more than 80% Australian-owned. Uh, and on its way to becoming a billion-dollar company. Um, this year became part of the ASX Top 200 and the ASX Fast 50 in terms of growth. So it's been a meteoric rise for uh, the company, um, headquartered jointly now out of Hong Kong and Sydney. Uh, we currently are in 140 countries 
We do a lot of US government and NATO and UK government business. Uh, we have a, about, I don't think it says so there, but we have about 1,250 staff worldwide and about three quarters of those are engineers. So uh, if you're looking for somewhere to go, uh, we're one of the biggest employers. We're also the biggest uh, buyer and seller of satellite capacity worldwide. So uh, currently we purchase and resell about 10 gigahertz of satellite capacity per month, which is, uh, to figure that out, it's an enormous amount. And uh, so it's a very vibrant com company, and uh, you can see our coverage. The main, thing, uh, the main areas that we're uh, involved in is mining, oil, gas, maritime. Uh, we're the largest supplier to cruise ships in the world, and, uh, uh, and defence especially. Um, a baby of mine is we also uh, recently won the contract to supply services to the Australian Antarctic Division and we just uh, last week uh, finished installing services to all of their bases. Uh, we've still got Macquarie Island and their icebreaker and their airstrip to go and we have to finish those this summer because uh, the weather's closing in. Um, <clears throat> give you a, a quick snapshot. We have 40 teleports worldwide uh, that we utilise, 30 of those we own ourselves. Um, we've recently uh, expanded on the teleport here in Mawson Lakes and are running out of room. Uh, we're very good friends with the city of Salisbury who do all our uh, building and planning approvals and uh, uh, help out greatly, cut down trees for us, all that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, we run global networks in C-band, X-band, KU, KA, UHF, L-band. So uh, all of those, if I gave you a coverage map, it would just look uh, the same all the way across. The, um, probably the reason that Speedcast has been so successful in a short space of time is because Speedcast is about seamless integration projects. So really going to the nth degree to make it, uh, the satellite segment, a seamless part of the operation of a company. So if somebody picks up their phone and dials an extension in Adelaide and the phone rings in Octeti in Papua New Guinea uh, and it's just an extension on the corporate network, that's fantastic. That's exactly how it should happen. It shouldn't be that it's a difficult process. It should be that it's seamlessly integrated with the way you operate day to day. And that's one of the credos of uh, Speedcast, that they integrate to that extent so that it's seamless to the user. And that's been one of the big success stories. The other big success story is that they run uh, network operation centres worldwide. We've got five of them, so we can follow the sun. So we can also always have, we, we run the service here and in Perth 24-7. And uh, when you call up uh, the network operations centre, an engineer is going to answer the phone and an engineer is going to be assigned to fix your problem. It's not somebody picking up the phone who hands it on to someone else and hands it on to someone else. It's a, the guy who picks up the phone or the girl who picks up the phone is going to solve the problem. And uh, I think that... Um, with convergence in the uh, industry, I think we all discovered that IP and TCP IP uh, were great uh, opportunities for re-emergence re of the satellite industry. Uh, we discovered that uh, satellites love IP, they just don't like TCP very much. And uh, so making that integration happen in a seamless way is really what the company's been about. Fleet Space Technologies is a start-up company, uh, uh, as Michael said, uh, based in Adelaide. It's a very exciting uh, new arrival on the scene in Adelaide. And uh, Fleet has, uh, it's true that they have an ambition to launch 100 nanosatellites, but really it's a broader vision than that. Fleet is aimed at the Internet of Things, and not only the Internet of Things, but the very top of that market, the massive IoT market. So not just hundreds of sensors or hundreds of actu actuators, but millions of actuators and potentially billions of actuators. Fleet also uh, very much understands that 
the technology has to be a handshake between ground segment and space segment and, and a very close integration of those two. So the problem for fleet, or the problem that fleet is addressing is that by 2025 there will be 75 billion IoT devices worldwide and they will need to connect. And we constantly hear about the constellations of 4,000 satellites and all the, the new sats that are going up. They are oriented more towards broadband or connectivity, but not necessarily oriented towards the type of connectivity needed for millions or billions of short data messages. Though that sort of traffic and the handling of that traffic and the integration of that traffic with people's business is a very different proposition and it won't, be happen, happen, uh, it won't happen just because you can open a pipe and open a communication second session. In fact, it definitely won't work that way because the power demands and the integration demands of doing it that way will be prohibitive. So old space is uh, evolving in its own way and uh, we're seeing that uh, there's a, a definite gravitation from geostationary satellites to MEOs and LEOs, um, but I don't think it means that old space is going away any time soon, and in fact yeah, it seems to be emerging that the symbiosis between LEOs and MEOs and their big brothers out at GEO is becoming more, not less. <clears throat> New space, of course, is about small nanos that can be launched in their tens or their hundreds, um, a uh, recent PSLV launch uh, launched more than 100 nanos in one go out of an injector, and we can see that happening more and more all the time. But with that uh, increase in the population, uh, an increase in a whole range of other problems that we're going to talk about today. Um, Fleet is building uh, a base of intellectual property around LP WAN. So talking to sensors on the ground for agriculture, for logistics, for mining, for a range of different uh, um, propositions on the ground that require masses uh, of sensors or masses of bits of information uh, converging on a central point. And edge computing, so you acquire information from billions of sensors, what do you do with that? If you push it all up onto uh, the space segment without any refinement, you're not going to have any, um, or you're going to have a lot of traffic problems. So edge computing, data analytics, handling that data in a, in a smart way is very much what's at the heart of uh, the intellectual property of fleet. Sorry, I've introduced Nicola. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks Thank very you. much. Our final speaker this evening is Nicola Sassanelli. He is a, an electronics engineer, a graduate of the University of Bari in Italy, and uh, his early career was in microelectronics, but very soon he uh, joined the Italian diplomatic service and uh, found himself um, as the scientific attaché at the Embassy of Italy in Canberra in Australia. And uh, from there, he uh, was headhunted, I know, um, to come and work in South Australia. And um, he has had a number of senior positions in the South Australian government, the most recent of which is um, as uh, one of the directors of the South Australian Space Industry Centre, which has, uh, was launched uh, in September at the International Astronautical Congress. And um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Nicola and uh, to invite him to tell you a little bit about uh, the South Australian Space Industry Centre. Thank you, Mark. So thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, and uh, uh, again, congratulations to you, Michael, uh, 
uh, Tanya for these wonderful courses is uh, is amazing. You know, 50 uh, students from 15 countries is really is an icon for the South Australia and is a really is an important asset for us. So as you um, also, uh, we start to talk before about uh, the change of, uh, of the space economy in the last 10 years, and that is a, is a long process, as you know. So we can say that 10 years ago, 20% of the space economy was managed by commercial entity and 80% from government. Now we have you know, more than uh, 70% is managed by commercial and 24% uh, and, uh, and, uh, from uh, um, government. But this is, is a, a very um, um, not quickly process. In other words, it is slowly. And I would like to share with you some data and, uh, in order to um, think about about the future and the trend of the space uh, industry in the future, in particular in, in Australia and South Australia. So as everybody knows, you know, the, the, the global space economy is more than 330 billion. 38 percent is um, infrastructure from commercial. 38 percent is from um, product services, so um, mainly service from commercial. And then we have 24 percent that is uh, um, founded or supported by government. Among these, uh, there are uh, more or less 11 percent that is dedicated for for defense. What is important is uh, uh, to analyze some of these data because they can give us some idea for uh, you know, the future for South Australia. So about the infrastructure, um, as you can see, uh, the, main, the main topic is, uh, is the ground station and the equipment that is, uh, you know, take more than uh, one-third of the uh, space economy. But, you know, uh, the satellites manufacturing, the launch satellites is very important. It's very important to highlight that uh, in 2016 there was 85 launch in all around the world, and then is uh, just uh, 21 from commercial. So that means that was, you know, 64 launch that is, was uh, um, funded by government. So that means that the, the government is still playing an important role. You know, the, the payloads managed and funded by the government is an important role. But, you know, among these, uh, um, uh, th these 85 um, launch, they allow uh, 232 um, spacecraft. Uh, um, that was deployed in, in, the, in the orbits. And also this Im is an important element to understand w what is the, fu the future and why this process is too slow. So among these 232, just 82 were nanosatellites land less than 100 kilo, well, less than 10 kilograms. So what does it mean that this uh, 232 um, uh, spacecraft is uh, bringing the orbit something like 359, you know, tons, but the 82 nanosatellites is just 300 grams. So, you know, it's really important to, to um, understand that this process you know, to the commercial side is quite, is quite slow uh, and not quick as we would like to see. So, but what is important for us um, today is uh, um, the uh, services and then the downstream of, uh, of the supply chain in the space. And then, as you can see, is 38% from, uh, you know, uh, broadcasting, satellite communication, uh, earth observation, internet of things, uh, uh, geolocation and navigation uh, activity. So what I would like to uh, share with you today is uh, if we operated uh, in the downstream, because, you know, the upstream is uh, still a big domain of uh, uh, state government and some multinational company. So we need to understand uh, in which way the space technology can help in order to increase 
and improve the quality and the services of uh, our economy and our uh, activity. So there are some sectors that is, this is just a list of the sector that could be, uh, that can benefit from the space technology, that can benefit from um, image and data from satellites. And this was an exercise that we did in, uh, in the office in December. We have in, in Australia uh, more than uh, uh, 1 million and 400 companies that operated in all of these fields. So if we can, if we are able, and that is what Fleet or was uh, Mariota or Elemetrix is doing. So our startup is working in this sector to knock the door to this company and say, look, I have this image, I have this data, I can elaborate for you, you know, uh, part of this activity and then I can improve your services or, uh, in, increase the, uh, or improve the quality of your product. So if we are able just to penetrate 0.1% of this population, that means that in Australia, we have more or less 40,000 of companies that operate in all the sectors that uh, we selected, like uh, agrofood, like uh, uh, maritimes, like um, environment and, uh, and um, uh, bureaus, um, uh, meteorology, etc. So, and that is a very important concept for us because in this particular moment where we don't know what's happening in Canberra, space agency yes or space agency no, strategic plan, national plan, and budget for national plan. So that is really important to, uh, in some way, open new market in terms of uh, medium satellites or big satellites. But what we have now is to work in downstream, and that is exactly what we are looking for. So uh, South Australian Space Industry Center was established, as you say, last year, but we set up an office two years ago. And the goal, the main goal is what Tanya said before, you know, is to stimulate this um, ecosystem, the space ecosystem. Our ambition is to have a vibrant space ecosystem where our stakeholders means uh, you know, entrepreneurs, uh, researchers, uh, um, um, academic, uh, university schools, STEM is very important, can, uh, can, uh, can work together and, and, and proliferate. So we um, published last year this uh, space agents, uh, this, uh, this uh, strategy, and that is the first one, I think, is the only one in Australia. And what we uh, did with uh, this uh, publication is uh, a sort of consensus we share with all the stakeholders that is mean the, the, the main uh, actor of the triple helix, you know, academia, um, uh, government, and uh, entrepreneurs, what they think about, you know, the future of the space and what we can manage. So I, this is just last question, uh, the last slide, just to tell you what, what is about the future, and that is, believe me, is in some way independent of what's happening in Canberra. So if Canberra is come with a, a, a space agency happy, we can work together, we already work together. But if not, if there is no budget, so we have you know, our pathway. So we have three main um, projects. One is a space innovation fund that is, uh, we operated with the three uh, program. One is a scholarship, one in, uh, incubator, and one accelerator. I hope that in the next two weeks the Premier could announce you know, who is the, um, the local organization, the international part that is involved in this um, activity for the next four years. So there are $4 million. $1 million, per year per, $1 million per year for the next four years. Then we are working on the aerospace innovation facilities. So we just, we arrived, you know, some a request from a consortium of startups has come to us and say, look, we would like to grow with some facility that means test, that is mean launch, that is mean, you know, um, work together. And then we, we are working in order to provide some, 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 uh, some um, uh, solution. And then, uh, as Tanya said before, we are very close to the University of South Australia uh, to support this cooperative research center that I think will be 
the most important cooperative research center in this space in the, in the, the last 20 years. And, uh, and uh, Andy is here, Tanya is here, they are strongly supported, and we are strongly close to them. And then we have the recurring activity, you know, um, the space forum, the next one is uh, 12 of, uh, of April, so everybody is invited. And of course, you know, um, some other activity that may be, you know, happy to discuss later. And that is all for me, thank you. So thank you to all of our speakers. Um, we now have about 30 minutes um, available for discussion and interaction with the audience. So I really encourage you to uh, ask, quest ask any of our panellists uh, a question, uh, put up your hand and we'll bring you a mic. We already have uh, a few lined up. But can I just kick off the discussion with, with one uh, question for the panel or those of you who would like to um, address an answer to this. Um, there's no doubt that we are right here in Mawson Lakes and the centre of innovation in space in Australia. And the South Australian Government was the first Australian Government to pick up on the idea to get the, to get the idea that uh, investment and encouragement of um, uh, space technologies and space development was important for our future and um, that idea has been picked up um, slowly by uh, the other state governments and then the other really exciting thing that has happened is quite recently the city of Salisbury has said well we'd like to be known as the space precinct and that has happened just by um, through discussion and through uh, interaction between the, the sort of people that you um, see on the panel tonight. But one of the really interesting phenomena in the space sector in this country is the number of start-ups, the, the, the level of entrepreneurism, and the, and the number of young, bright young engineers and scientists who have decided to establish their own businesses. And I can tell you that the latest statistic is that we have about, or well, we've counted about 85 startups in this country, which per head of population is probably, I'm almost certain that it's probably the highest proportion of startups in the world. So my question for the panel, or those of you who uh, would like to answer this, is how does that impact on your, what you do um, as a university or as local government or as state government? But in particular, I'm interested in how the primes perceive this phenomenon of, in this country of um, this wave of uh, entrepreneurism, especially by young graduates, um, some of whom don't have much commercial experience or professional experience. Um, is this a good thing, or um, how do you, do you think they'll end up... Um, they'll, well, what do you think will happen to many of these start-up companies? <laughs> yeah, I think we might, uh, might have a go. Um, so one of the things we do as a corporation is try and foster innovation in the community. Um, we were involved last year in another startup um, called the Techstars Adelaide Defence Accelerator. Um, and it's really interesting to see um, young people come along full of enthusiasm um, with good ideas but very little commercial experience, as you said, Mark. Um, and I think overall... It's a very good thing to, to try and foster that. Um, and one of the roles I see for the big corporations is, is in mentoring these startups right, to enable them to succeed because traditionally startups come with a good idea, um, last a little while and, and then disappear. And if we're to keep the, uh, the IP in, in, in Australia and to keep the enthusiasm going to invest in, uh, in new technologies, then we have to be able to help grow the startups and turn them into viable businesses. And eventually we might look at... Uh, uh, acquiring some of them, if that's appropriate. But, um, but, but I think it is. The, the, the more we have this innovation culture in, in the state, then the more we'll breed, as I said, the social licence to, um, to, to to be in business and to attract new and, and, and increasing talent into that area. I'll comment as well, and I completely agree with everything that Wayne just said. That the startups in general, you, know, you only get a small percentage that actually make it. Um, 
but it doesn't mean that their ideas weren't great. It just, it's trying to get them into the right channels and being able to actually present to the right people, um, and that's critical. The, the idea behind what you want to do with the startup is, is not stifle them, and this is one of the biggest problems I think that large primes have, is we have a saying, at least in Lockheed, we love them to death. Uh, because we're so large, cumbersome from those perspectives. When you, if you bring them too close, it stops their ability to be innovative, uh, and they, they get wrapped up in the, the business cycle. So it's, it's trying to find a mechanism to keep them at least arm's length away, but give them the, the, the lightest touch possible until they start to flourish. Once they start to flourish, then you actually can let them know about how to sustainability, maintainability. Um, and the other is, I think a lot of small businesses suffer from a lack of an exit plan. Is where, where are you actually trying to achieve? Is it an ongoing concern and you're trying to position it for a sale? What do you want to do with your products? Um, I think some startups fail because of the fact that they don't have the vision of where they're trying to take it. And as Wayne says, you know, you want to fatten them up so you can buy them. Well, if that's what you're trying to do and that's not what the company wants, then parting ways early is the best. Because where you're trying to go or where you're trying to drive the company to go is not in the direction where the owners want to take it. And that's really, really critical is having an understanding of where, where do you want to be five, ten years down the road. Um, just so larger companies can take that into perspective and figure out the best way to actually engage with them. From, mm -hmm. oh. uh, Mark, so from my point of view, I think uh, uh, having a foot in both camps, yeah. so the established one and the, uh, and the start, um, apart from uh, the obvious uh, age difference between myself and everyone else in the fleet when I walk in the door... Um, <laughs> Uh, it's an exciting place to be, and it's an exciting place to be because when you look at it, what is a startup? If you said there are 80 new startups in Australia, that's 80 pieces of intellectual property that are entering our economy and going to make it or not. Because they don't make it as a business doesn't mean that the IP goes away. Quite often the IP just morphs into something else. So a percentage of those startups will do very well, and the more dynamic the startup, I think, the more the opportunity they have to raise money, the more opportunity they have to be successful and gain some critical mass. So it's getting that balance between maturing the IP and merging it with commercial success that's going to be the very difficult thing. And I like what Jack was saying, that uh, as a larger player, you want to constantly refresh your, uh, your IP but you don't want to smother it with kindness. I think it, nearly, it really needs to grow and succeed on its own two feet, and that's the, that's the best injection we can have into our economy. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Just really briefly, I think I said it in my few minutes, mm. but um, we really see our role at the university is creating the conditions and the environment in which entrepreneurs can get their first footing, um, partly by just creating the conditions in which students get to know what industry partners are in a certain space and get to know some of the problems they're facing by providing challenges while they're studying that are real industry challenges. We also work through things like our Venture Catalyst program to have small seed funding programs for startups um, of our graduates. So there's a range of ways in which we play um, in order to support, as I said before, students having a chance to explore their entrepreneurial tendencies in a safe environment. Michael, what is important for us is uh, to support a vibrant ecosystem where this startup can grow. And the example of the last year was incredible. Six startups in South Australia was generated thanks to these uh, environments. So as you know, Tanya said at the beginning, the rule of the government is uh, you know, to uh, stimulate or um, support uh, building a climb where we can uh, um, uh, support this, uh, this economy. So the startup are the future because uh, um, the multinational company that is coming here is not easy and they have to come because they have to find important opportunities. Otherwise, they're not come. But the startup is what we call the um, endogenous growth. So it's come from our university, spin off from our university, but they have to grow in a vibrant ecosystem. Otherwise, they can go away. 
So it's very important for us um, to support this environment in the future, and uh, this uh, Space Innovation Fund is uh, oriented this, uh, for this uh, purpose. Does the City of Salisbury see a, a role in, uh, in helping startups? Uh, absolutely. I guess uh, now I'm not an entrepreneur, don't pretend to be, but for me, I guess the, the biggest risk that entrepreneurs would have is in their first couple of years of business. And they might have the best, brightest idea out there. But if they're being killed because the council says you've got to have an extra car park outside your business or your rates are too high for your business, right at that very riskiest time, you know, you don't want council to be there killing them off. And similarly, they might have a great idea and they might not be aware that someone down the road's got exactly the same idea. So a couple of areas that we can really have a big assistance for them is A, reducing the cost of doing business, especially, and, and reducing the regulation you know, they've got to, get their, got to get their feet on the ground and we can assist with that and also through networking, through Polaris Centre and whatever, you know, networking, understanding who's out there, understanding what people's experiences are as well. You know, because if you're talking about one or two people in their bedroom developing an app, they want to move out to a premises, they're suddenly making a leap and people have done that before, you know, they've got the Lone Ranger, we've got the services there that can help them jump through that. Just, you don't want that bad idea to fail because of the 1% or 2% margin that they could have got with a bit of assistance from local or even state government. So absolutely we've got a role to play in it. Great. Well, I know that there are um, burning questions waiting to be asked. So, the gentleman in the front. Quick question for Tanya. Um, during your talk, you mentioned disruptive technologies. Would you mind elaborating on that? Because I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and then just another one, uh, just a quick one if I can get one. For Lockheed Martin and Saab, would your loyalties uh, lie here or would they be back to your home country in the US and Sweden? <laughs> Well, I'll take that question as a chance to answer the one that I got posed right at the beginning about what is nanoscale biophotonics. <laughs> Disruptive technologies are unexpected solutions to a problem. They're when a technology from one field then penetrates into another and provides an unexpected solution. One example um, is implants that a research team that I created are developing to sit inside your arteries to be able to tell you whether the plaques that form on the artery wall are likely to break off and form a blood clot. Now previously you would have had to go and have scans and if you had symptoms and if your physiology um, had showed some thickening your doctor might draw conclusions but the reality is is the majority of people who experience such arterial thickening don't get blood clots and don't go on to need stents put in. So disruptive technologies is taking something like a, an optical fibre sensor and realising you can miniaturise it so you can implant it in the body and thus change the course of that patient's journey. In the, in the space industry, um, you know, some of the technologies coming now in AI, I suspect, will be utterly disruptive in terms of the way we do space communications and other aspects of the whole space technology area. So what I think we have the opportunity to do is create the environment where we facilitate people with problems, industry largely, sometimes government, hearing about the new emerging technologies and creating an environment where people can understand whether it can apply to them. And thus, that's what disruptive technology is. It's not incremental innovation, it's a complete step change in how you approach a problem. I'll answer first. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, I'm assuming, US or Australia? Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> loyalties or royalties? I wasn't <laughs> So if we're going with, ro was it royalties or loyalties? Loyalties. Okay. <laughs> yes, I have an American accent, but I'm an Australian citizen. Um, so as a company, as we operate, it, it really comes down to what, where it's generated it tends to be where it gets returned to. So um, as a large corporation, we sell products that are coming straight into a, uh, into a country, but they were generated out of the U.S., so therefore the royalty or loyalty or profit goes back to where that is. Here in Australia, we have our own capabilities. We generate products out of that that gets reinvested. We have uh, our research and development programs. We have an independent what we call a stellar lab over in Melbourne, uh, which is working with universities and in, in kind of disruptive technologies to actually create those things um, and, and for the global market. Now, one of the 
one of the drivers, one of the nice drivers, is the fact that we're an American company. Now, for those that are aware of defense, um, the U.S. puts a lot of restrictions on what you can and can't do. Uh, it's called ITAR, International Treaty and Arms Restrictions. Arms Restrictions, Arms restrictions. thank you. Um, get used to acronyms too much. Um, so out of that, anything comes out of the U.S. into another country has a lot of restrictions and controls on it. Things that are generated here are open to the global market. So from our perspective, it's very important that we grow markets here and we can actually use this as a global base to be able to offer our products to a lot larger audience than we could if it was just a U.S.-based product. Um, so the answer is pretty much the same, I think. Saab's been in Australia for around about 30 years. Um, it started off with a, a technology transfer out of Sweden um, towards uh, building combat systems for our naval fleet. Um, today there's no Swedes working in Saab in Australia. Uh, it's a fully Australian workforce. And in fact, we now export the technology that we brought in 30 years ago, both back to Sweden but internationally. So, you know, where do our loyalties lie? Well, we're an Australian company. Yes, we have a Swedish parent, um, and we have some obligations back to the to the parent. But our our business here is focused in Australia for the benefit of Australia. And we're the opposite. We're an Australian company with the vast majority of our business overseas. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the space industry is a traditionally very international industry. Uh, so my question, I guess, to the, to the to industry guys are how, how receptive are your international offices and companies uh, to working internationally and collaboratively? And then to the universities and government, what are your recommendations or what are you doing to help uh, promote international collaboration? Who wants to have a go at that? Just a very brief answer from universities. I think that's something we bring to the collaboration mix because by the very nature of our business, we are international. Our students get international experiences. Our students come from overseas as well. Um, our staff are very diverse. Um, and our research collaborations, when you work with the best in the world um, in your field, so I think that's something we do bring to partnerships is a strong international focus. If you're working in a field, you know where the best stuff's happening and there's really not a barrier to working together. We, from a Lockheed perspective, we have alliances with a, a lot of different nations, a lot of different universities around the world for the whole purpose of growing collaboration and, and development in those areas. Uh, wherever we can find where there's a partnership, you know, currently our space division has a relationship with EOS, um, in, in Canberra and out in the West for the purpose that they have technology that it, it makes a lot of sense that we can get information from. So it's finding those partnerships um, and, and trying to then grow that into, in fact, they're looking at how they're taking that globally out of Australia from those perspectives. So it's keenly interested. As I go back to the, my reference about a big ship, right, we, it takes us too long to turn. We can't change. So we need these small industries, and we want them in the global market. And, and we have a special team called the Global Supply Chain, Supply Chain that goes out and searches for them. And our alliances, once again, with the universities help greatly for them. So, so I think we live in a very globalised world now, and it's not possible to operate without international collaboration. Um, you know, we import most of our computing equipment, we import most of our electronics. Um, so when you want to build something in Australia, you're actually operating in a global marketplace. And I think, you know, the reason that international companies come to Australia is part of that globalisation strategy. But we also need to think about what it means for startups, right? because they can't rely on only resources that are available in Australia. Right? They're going to have to look at how do they connect up with international organisations, how do they pull, bring the breast of breed technology into Australia to support their own startup businesses. And I think that's where some of the the international corporations, which are already here, can facilitate making that, uh, uh, that, that, ch that change from purely local to global business. Mm. If I answer it from uh, Fleet's point of view, because Fleet is building an ecosystem of satellites and ground stations, and yes, it has the IP, but for the components for the IP, 
you want to look for the best of breed around the world. You don't want to be isolating yourself and say, I can do everything here. We've been very uh, fortunate to be a participant in the uh, government's uh, grant scheme and uh, building a mission control centre down at Beverly to service clients of orbital satellites from all around the world. So we're building infrastructure that can service the rest of the world. We're trying to get the best of breed as far as componentry from around the world. And uh, in the course of doing all of that, you also accumulate, if you can, the best people from around the world. Uh, it's just a natural thing. The space industry is by its nature universal. Mm. I, perhaps I could just add to that. Um, Fleet has employed at least one of the graduates of this program. Yes. And what, uh, one of the things our graduates bring with them is the network of contacts that they've already made among their fellow students and the professors and lecturers. And um, that, I'm, I'm sure I'm, no one's going to disagree with me from ISU, that network is probably the, the best asset that uh, you gain by doing this program. Michael, also, you know, in our strategy, one of the three pillar is the engage internationally. So for us, it's uh, quite important. The last year, you know, we also, thanks to, um, to the Space Industry Association of Australia, the, the International Astronaut Conference, and that is a sort of kickoff of the international collaboration for us. We signed an important agreement with Germany, with Italy, with France, and. Uh, um, we are looking uh, to be present at International Solar Conference in uh, Bremen uh, this year. So, and what we'd like to do is in some way to involve our stakeholders, and that this means uh, not only entrepreneurs and research centers, but also schools, because STEM is another important mm -hmm. puzzle of, uh, of the, our ecosystem. So, yes, the answer is. We have very important international collaboration for a state like us that is quite small. Hmm. Thank you. I think I see a question from one of the participants in the program. I'm interested in hearing the panel's view on what activities you think an Australian space agency should undertake to support the space industry in this country. Uh, how long have you got? How long have we got? All right, well, let's, uh, let's start at that end and yes. just and move just towards Just one this end. quickly answer. What we'd like to see is a, a strategic national plan for the space economy industry in the future here. So that's what we'd like to see. That could be managed by the space agency or by a group, but what we'd like to see is a strategy for the next five years where we can, you know, in some way invite uh, industry, researchers to work together in this uh, 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 sector. So to me, that, that is really what is important. There are so, so many answers, but I, I think that What's really important is that the Australian space industry has been lagging behind from a regulatory point of view and from a supervisory point of view, and there's a lot happening. There are some crises happening in the uh, satellite industry at the moment that really need to be dealt with at a government level and at an international level, and we have to put some leverage into that. Um, at the last WRC, uh, satellite industry got shot down because... Uh, C-band ground, ground basically devolved to mobile operators because uh, they had more leverage at WRC. And you can see the same thing happening in a lot of areas. There's a land grab for frequencies and um, the technology of antennas is changing greatly. So what used to be ground that was, uh, say, mobile for Inmarsat is now becoming land grab for everybody. And the... Um, the the landscape for future 5G is very unclear, so there are embargoes in different areas in different countries. There's a lot that can be done by governments if the agency is active. Um, there's also an emerging crisis in uh, sun-synchronous orbits um, with Space Junk and insurance for uh, sun-synchronous satellites in that area. So there's a lot for the uh, industry to do. I think the thing that... Um, 
is probably a success factor for the uh, uh, national agency is that there is so much going on in the space industry at the moment. If they can make successes of some of the um, companies that are emerging and take the roadblocks out of the way, they can be seen to be contributing to the economy uh, and generating jobs and success. And I think that's very important because some of the things that they have to do are not going to be profitable, not going to be popular, and they need to have some successes as well. So Australia's had a couple of aborted efforts at having a space industry, going back to uh, the 60s when we had WRE set, going through to uh, what was OSSAT, the uh, National Telecommunications Satellite Program. Um, and in each case, I think, the... Um, the lack of a vision for what the space industry should look like in Australia has ultimately led to the demise of those, uh, those initiatives. So the thing that I see is the, is the key thing for a national space um, uh, support agency is to establish the vision um, and, to, as you said, to, to clear the roadblocks, the, the, regulatory, frame, the her, regulatory hurdles, um, the, the commercial hurdles. We're never going to have a, a national space association that's going to be subsidising the space industry. I don't think the government's in that particular place. But industry will live and die on its own commercial terms if it has a, if it has a, a clear road to, to operate on. So establish the vision, remove the regulatory hurdles and support the industry. I think it's the, it's, it's the way I see it working. I like your answer. <laughs> so I was basically going to say the same thing. I think the only other is uh, a, a body of awareness, building the global ties to ensure that um, we have a one-stop shop that we can go to to understand what's actually happening in the space um, domain across, across the planet. Um, right now you're left to your own devices in certain areas and you don't know what the challenges are that each government is dealing with. Um, but I, I completely agree that the vision is, is the critical point. And I think it's got to be a vision that's not going to say I'm going to be everything for everything. It's got to be it's got to be a true one that we can all strive for. The view I'd like to add to the panel's great suggestions so far is that the strategy must include something of the scale of a national mission that can be a real you know guiding star for industry development and serve to inspire kids to study STEM and people like yourself to go on and explore careers in space because I think that's a unique attribute this field has and I think um, it talks to the need to prioritise and, and look at what our distinctive strengths are here. So I think that that's what the space agency's role would be if it moves forward and of course there'd need to be a budget with that and that's courage that we need. <laughs> exactly. Yes, for me, I'll quote John Lennon those old enough to remember him, so <laughs> you know, you may say I'm a dreamer with this, but my number one goal for the space agency would not to become a self licking ice cream. <laughs> right? An organisation that just exists to serve itself and have patches and business cards and funky caps. Maybe snow globes if you're lucky. Right? You'd have to ask at the end of the day if you went to the, if if any, you could go to anyone to provide a service, a space agency service, would you go to these people? And hopefully the answer is yes, right? As opposed to actually, no, they're just in buggerants, get out of our way kind of thing. So what I'd like to see is, what I'd like to see, again, the dreamer part, almost like we had the warship building plan, which I think that should extend to civilian ships myself, but a similar coming together, a similar strategic plan. You know, the warship building plan is a 40-year plan. Why aren't we doing that for space? Why can't we do that for space? And I want the agency... You know, to ensure that we have so many what we call centres of excellence out there, we've got to make sure those centres of excellence don't become what, what are called stovepipes of ignorance. Right? So the agency should be there, not, I would say, not actually doing work themselves. The work they should be doing is facilitating, encouraging, providing certainty, matching companies up with other companies, working with the universities, working with the state governments, working with the schools and the primary schools, the STEM program. It's got to be a holistic, you know, I think in terms of priority and industry capability that we've known for some good capabilities. And that's where I see, that's what I'd like the space agency to do, apart from having funky caps and badges. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll save my answer to, to our next team project meeting. 
Um, well, our time is up, and um, I'd like to thank our distinguished panellists. I hope you all enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Please join with me in thanking you. And now I'd like to call upon uh, the director of the SHSSP, Dr Omar Hatamle, to make a, a special announcement. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, Carol Carnett, if you can join us here, please. If you can join us. <laughs> <laughs> well, Carol is actually the director of the English programs for the International Space University and she has been part of the Southern Hemisphere Space Studies program since 2011. She's definitely a key member uh, to make the program successful. And today actually is her last day with the program. She retires and she, she's not going to join us next year. So on behalf of the International Space University and the uh, UniSA, I would like to give her a small token of appreciation and a big round of applause. I'd just like to add to that by saying that Carol has been responsible for our space English program in every program we've done in Adelaide since 2011. So she has been with us for the entire seven programs and she is by far the most popular staff member <laughs> we've ever had. And so it, yeah, I also want to thank her most sincerely for everything she's done for this program. So with that, please join us for refreshments and please uh, enjoy the uh, uh, space art exhibition sponsored by the City of Salisbury.